Hello everyone and welcome back to the long overdue final analysis of the Golden Compass here on the Game Professor channel. I'm your host, The Game Professor, and today we are finally going to dig into this game and talk about what makes it a decent adaptation despite being a pretty bad game overall. If you haven't checked out my Let's Play yet, it is linked up in the cards for your viewing pleasure. And I do highly encourage everyone to at least familiarize yourselves with the game a bit before watching this analysis, so definitely take a chance to do that so that you can get as much out of this discussion as possible. Now that you're back from the game itself, I want to start off this discussion and analysis with how we know that this is a bad game, because I expect there are a number of reasons that come to mind from watching or playing it that aren't really why it's a bad game. <laughs> I intend to get into this general topic in greater depth in an episode of The Game Professor's Take, but to start off, the graphics and animations, while definitely being behind the times for when this game came out, came out the same year as both Assassin's Creed and Mass Effect. Along with the length of the game, it's approximately 9 hours, so relatively short in modern game terms, are not factors that make this game bad. I will instead be talking specifically about the gameplay itself on a functional level, because given that what makes games games as their gameplay, that is literally what determines whether or not a game is successful. There has been a shift in gamer perspective that graphics and length or size of a game are integral to the success or quality of a game, and while there is a critical economic piece to that perspective, it's truly not a good way to determine quality or success in a game. I also want to start on this topic because I want to break down the impression that a bad game is inherently worthless. Bad games can make it difficult for gamers to properly or fully experience the games, but if there's good and or purposeful material within the game, it should still be acknowledged for what it is. A big thing to keep in mind is that many literary works that are now lauded as masterpieces within the literary canon are ostensibly bad books, and they were viewed as such in their times, so looking beyond the flaws is critical to finding meaning and value in some works. I will also preface this discussion by acknowledging that this is a game that was most likely made with a wider non-gamer audience in mind, because it's a movie tie-in or licensed game. I am not approaching these critiques from the perspective of a seasoned gamer. I'm instead looking at the gameplay as a vehicle for presenting the narrative of the Golden Compass with an awareness of that likely wider market audience in mind. That being said, what is it that makes the Golden Compass a bad game? The first gameplay element that the Golden Compass struggles with is movement. There are two main types of movement the player deals with, Eurix, which focuses almost purely on combat, and Lyra's, which focuses on exploration and platforming. The movement itself, at its core, is clunky and simply doesn't feel natural. There are often thick invisible walls that make it impossible to get close to real in-game walls or other visible barriers, and that limits game immersion. The game also often has very specific spots that either Yurik or Lyra must be in in order to do something, and the lack of fluid, reliable, and precise movement can make it nearly impossible to actually complete tasks. This is all exacerbated by the lack of a movable camera, which can lead to a ton of random, awkward movements from both Yurik and Lyra, but Lyra's movements are more potentially problematic given the intrinsic platforming element of her gameplay. The scripted camera movement also can camouflage what the player is meant to see or interact with in some cases, making these spaces more difficult to traverse than they need to be. The second gameplay element that's problematic is the changing nature of Yurik's combat based on enemies. Now, the simple fact that enemies change and gameplay develops over the course of the game is not the problem. Games will utilize different enemies consistently, and it's perfectly logical that they will require different tactics for the player to be successful. But for this game, the enemies are essentially separated out by narrative segments of the game going from the Samoyeds and Wolves, to the General Oblation Board or Gobblers, to the Witches, and then finally back to humans with no fluid or meaningful development of the combat. Furthermore, the human enemies, as well as the wolves by and large, can easily be defeated with the same simple button mash tactics, and while combos are introduced for Yurik relatively early on, they're never necessary throughout the majority of the game's combat. The game even seems to encourage button mashing when it introduces the combos saying, after grabbing an enemy, quickly push buttons to try different grappling moves. 
When you start fighting the witches, however, combos not only suddenly become completely necessary, but they're different from the combos that you have been using before if you were better at paying attention to combos than I am. For a note, I don't play many fighting games, so combos rarely compute for me as a player. That's why I'm very button mashy. However, even though I'm not good at using combos, I do know that the use of combos relies heavily on muscle memory. So suddenly changing what you have to do in a way that goes against muscle memory is counterintuitive. You also have the completely random change in gameplay to essentially a fighting minigame and quick time events during the fight with Ragnar, which makes the fight really simplistic and almost removes the weight of that fight, which narratively is about putting Yurik back in his rightful place as king of the Panzerbjorn. The third gameplay element that's less than stellar is the mini-games for Lyra's various deception and combat encounters. I will preface this with the note that I am not anti-minigame. In fact, I think that conceptually, the use of mini-games for Lyra is quite effective here. The developers just came up short in their choices for the specific mini-games. Starting with the combat minigame, it's essentially a game of Simon, but it's not even that. You're given a directional prompt and you have to move the joystick that direction within a period of time to dodge an attack. This takes very little skill, which on the one hand seems to suit the wider non-gamer audience, but on the other it seems like a disingenuous representation of the character involved with the gameplay. Even though Lyra is not a combat-oriented character, though she'd definitely put up a fight if she needed to, this type of minigame is overly simplistic and frankly reduces her character significantly. It suggests that she can't fight, she can only dodge and avoid. Even Pan's iteration of it, though he's always in wildcat form and therefore has weapons in the form of his teeth and claws, maintains this avoidance tactic. It's just unfortunate that Lyra, who's an excellent example of a strong young heroine, is reduced in this manner. Turning to the deception event minigames, the problem is the fact that they have nothing to do with the conversations Lyra is engaging in, and that effectively renders them meaningless. As I've said, the use of minigames for Lyra is not in and of itself a problem, but the developers could have designed these minigames more purposefully given the function they have within the game. Use the minigames to craft a good or bad response. Make the player think like Lyra in order to succeed. Matching and or timing based avoidance or hitting of objects is meaningless within the context of this game's narrative. Furthermore, the collectibles ultimately make these minigames incredibly easy to beat to the point that the player really doesn't need to put forth any effort or thought to succeed. Again, this reduces the value of the action and through that reduces the value of Lyra's character. Finally, the most egregious gameplay failure within the Golden Compass is the Golden Compass itself, the alethiometer. This failure hits on multiple levels, the most significant one being the fact that it's possible to find answers to questions without correct symbols. The whole point of the alethiometer as an object is that it tells the truth through symbols that have specific meanings on infinite levels. If you don't have the symbols to ask the initial question correctly, there's no way that you'll get the answer you seek. Yes, the game gamifies the focus element of reading the alethiometer, which notably ties directly to how Lyra is able to read the alethiometer in the first place despite not having the books of meanings, and the number of correct symbols influences the difficulty of that particular action. But the ability to find answers without all the correct symbols still makes no sense whatsoever. The game is also keeping a cursor as close to a point as possible and hitting a button within a period of time, not actually analyzing the symbols that are pointed to. I don't even know if the answer arm actually points to symbols that make sense in answering the questions because I have to focus on the cursor's position and movement, not the arm of the alethiometer itself. Additionally, discovering a meaning from guessing it correctly does not add that meaning to your catalog of known meanings, which is completely nonsensical. While I do understand the stance that getting all the meanings could be difficult for some players, especially those who may not be regular gamers, but using her brain is precisely what Lyra does. Learning the meanings through her observations of the world, such as finding a meaning within the exploration of the game world, or through her own thinking, such as reasoning through the possible meanings and guessing correctly as the player, is still finding a meaning. 
Either of these should be sufficient to fill the meanings, thus making the process of reading the alethiometer easier as the game goes on, and the fact that reasoning out a meaning with one's own brain doesn't expand Lyra's knowledge is deeply troubling, especially when so many meanings are learned through the completion of bonus actions or activities, or some specific actions that you may not take for one reason or another when given the choice of that action or what you choose to do. Many of these additional activities or further exploration are things that seasoned gamers would do based on the genre and other cues provided by the game, such as platformers often having hidden areas or additional exploration you can do, so it behooves the player to look everywhere. So the wider audience the game is presumably marketed to may not know to do this at all. Giving players an alternate way to learn meanings while still requiring the meanings to be correct is a reasonable expectation for the player because Lyra literally has to understand the meanings in order to read the alethiometer. Removing that requirement, yet again, reduces Lyra's character significantly. And one final note on the alethiometer minigame is that it's not remotely necessary in the grand scheme of the game, barring a handful of instances where it's a required action, and that's just a missed opportunity. The fact that I had to do a whole specific episode going back through the journal to answer all the available questions is unfortunate when the alethiometer and Lyra's ability to read it is such a significant element of her characterization and narrative. Most of the questions also flesh out the narrative and world more fully, so for so many of them to not be required restricts the depth the game lets the player into in terms of everything the game offers at face value. Turning then to the successes of the game, I first want to discuss the narrative flow of the game. I know that I commented on the weird repeated tutorials throughout the early part of the game due to the flashback setup a couple of times during the Let's Play, but I've come to recognize a level of purpose behind the present day being the North prior to finding the unnamed severed child. This arises from the role Serafina Pekala plays as narrator. The game itself doesn't really dig into her as a character, but within the world of His Dark Materials, she's a witch queen, and the witches have a centuries-old prophecy concerning Lyra and her role as a second Eve causing a second fall, which we hear addressed briefly in Trollicent in the discussion between Father Corum and Dr. Lancelius. The game, in framing the narrative as told by Serafina Pekala, effectively makes this seem like a witch's telling of Lyra's story, which ties in with the prophecy. Yes, the player still focalizes through Lyra and Yurik as the player characters, but this framing suggests the greater weight of the narrative within the world of the game, even if it wasn't done completely effectively. The other highly present success comes from the general gameplay choices the developers made regarding both Yurik and Lyra. Even with all the gameplay flaws, it's impossible to ignore the fact that Yurik fits as a combat-focused player character and Lyra fits as an exploration player character. These choices on the development side tie directly to the characterization of both characters. Yurik is an armored bear, and culturally they live for and by war. Combat being the primary gameplay mechanic for him is completely logical. And with Lyra, her narrative arc focuses on exploration and discovery, so again, using her as the primary explorer and thereby using gamey exploration methods such as platforming is completely logical. And not only that, but the platforming even ties into her past at Jordan College in Oxford because of the shenanigans she got up to climbing around and getting herself into secret areas she shouldn't be getting into. At their cores, each of these general gameplay mechanics for their specific characters is a direct reflection of the character as Philip Pullman created them. That is an excellent adaptation choice. This choice also expands beyond what developers typically do with licensed game, merging two somewhat disparate gameplay styles into a single game, thus making it stand out in a sea of games that usually are mediocre carbon copies of other games within a single given genre. The next success comes from the use of Pantalaimon within Lyra's gameplay. Firstly, the fact that he's an integral part of it at all is a direct reflection of what demons are within Lyra's world, the human soul physically manifested. In order to properly adapt this world, this fact must be acknowledged and represented, so Pan's gameplay being such a fundamental part of Lyra's gameplay at large is a perfect nod to the role demons have within the game world. Secondly, the game took advantage of the fact that Lyra has not yet gone through puberty, and therefore Pan can shift his form. The most significant of his forms is his ermine form, which functionally reflects insight and helps Lyra learn more about the world around her. Again, 
Knowledge and the discovery of knowledge are crucial to Lyra's character arc, so Pan having a form that reflects this is highly pertinent. Pan's preferred form within the novel and all the various adaptations is also an ermine, so this form being such a critical part of Lyra's gameplay is a perfect in that regard as well. The only other form that really appears within the novel or film is the wildcat form, and the game's representation of this form yet again matches the functionality and meaning of that form for the novel and film perfectly. It's his combative form, when he feels attacked or targeted. The sloth and hawk forms, while they don't specifically appear in either the film or novel, represent another element of the ways Pan will choose his forms. Purpose. Each form functionally plays with an element of the platforming within Lyra's gameplay, and while Pan's forms tend to primarily be emotion-driven, he does also select forms functionally within certain circumstances within the novel and film. Finally, and this is a fairly minor success within the grand scheme of things, is the fact that the game corrects mistakes filmmakers made narratively in the final cut of the film. These mistakes are the order of events, the film has the events at Svalbard occur prior to those at Bolvanger, and the ending. The film notably cut out the final three chapters of the novel to include them in the next movie, which was never made. The order of events is the more complete rectification, but the allusion to the real ending through deleted scenes still makes the game feel more like it closes. The rectification of the sequence of events also makes the ending make much more sense than the film did. So that's that. The Golden Compass is ostensibly a bad game, but despite that, the developers still managed to make some incredibly smart and meaningful choices that still shine through and make the game function as a decent adaptation of both the film and novel. An important thing to keep in mind with the failures of this game, as I mentioned before in my first adaptation overview video as well as at the beginning of this video, is that this game is a licensed game, so it would have received very little funding and an unreasonably short development period. This is common among licensed games, the most famous example being the adaptation of E.T., and because of these factors, the games typically end up being carbon copies of other games within an existing genre. This game already merged two different gameplay elements based on the two player characters and managed to do it meaningfully with regard to the source material. Yes, the gameplay is clunky and the game is a bit of a slog to play through, but to merely write it off as a bad game and not consider the purposeful and interesting ways the developers made smart choices from an adaptation standpoint would be a huge disservice to both this game and the developers who made it. Thank you for checking out my Golden Compass analysis video. This was a long time coming, so I also thank you all for your patience and waiting for it. What are your thoughts on my conclusions? Do you have any thoughts on games being good or bad as the prime consideration in the value of a game? Let's get into the conversation here or on Facebook or in the Discord server. Both of those are linked below. And as always, be sure to hit the subscribe button so you always know when I have new videos coming out. And if you want to see my drafting process on videos like this, along with other exclusives I'm still coming up with, consider becoming a game scholar by supporting me on Patreon, also linked below. Thank you again for watching, and until next time, this is your Game Professor, signing off.